The following program is made possible by Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, the next stage. At a time when Congress is immensely unpopular, Peninsula Congresswoman Jackie Spear remains immensely popular. And she's here to talk to us. The game is politics and the game is on. Simon, welcome to the game. We're joined by Congresswoman Jackie Spear. Thank you for being here. She is a former San Mateo County Supervisor, member of the California Assembly and State Senator. Jackie was elected to the U.S. Congress in 2008, assuming the congressional seat held by her mentor, Leo J. Ryan. It's always nice to bring his name out sure for people is. who knew him such a long time ago. In Congress, she serves on the Oversight and Government Reform and House Armed Services Committee Committees and is Vice Chair of the House Gun Violence Prevention Task Force. Thank you for joining us. Jean. My pleasure. Let's talk about uh, the, the issue that's garnered a fair amount of national attention, gotten you on some other shows besides this one, uh, Rape in the Military. Mm -hmm. how, how did you get into that issue and, and how big is the problem? So that really started when I was still in the legislature, worked on issues around domestic violence, trying to extend the statute of limitation of rape. I mean, believe it or not, there's a 10-year statute of limitation for rape when now that we have DNA, why should there be any statute of limitation? So fast forward, I started looking into the issue and came across a complaint that had been filed in Washington, and I read the stories on a flight back from D.C. one night, and it sent chills up and down my spine, and I said, you know what? I'm not going to stop until we finally fix this, because for 25 years, this has been going on, one scandal after another, tail hook, academies, Air Force, and every time it happens, Congress gets all exercised, the big brass come up from the Pentagon, they say all the right things, zero tolerance, and then nothing changes. And the thing is that they, the issue there is that there's really no serious, that a lot of these things are not taken seriously, and that they're, they aren't really enforced in the sense of there's no consequence either to the people who commit the act or the people above them who fail to do anything. And of course, their answer all the time is, we can clean our own house. I, I gather you just don't think they can anymore. Well, clearly they haven't. 26,000 rapes, sexual assaults, or um, conduct that is unwanted a year to men and women. How do you know that? I mean, you know, that number, I mean, so many of these go unreported in some fashion or another. Right. How, how reliable is that number? So that's a survey they took. That's oh. a Pentagon survey, and they extrapolated from that survey, that's, survey that it's about 26,000 a year. 3,000 actually do report. Mm -hmm. And of those 3,000, only 500 actually go to court martial, and only less than 200 actually go to conviction. So anyone who wants to make a career in the military, the last thing you're going to do is file a complaint because what happens to you, you get ostracized, you get um, you know, sent to a point where you're considered a pariah, and then what they do is they honorably but involuntarily discharge you, and then they slap a label on you like personality disorder. Mm -hmm. So you take this DD-214, which is your discharge paper, to your prospective employer and have to explain what your personality disorder is, that you were raped mm -hmm. and the military just didn't want to have to deal with it. Closed institution, chain of command, it's whatever the commander wants, commander has no legal training and doesn't want it on his watch, doesn't want a record of rapes going on on his watch, or it's your best friend, or this is a good soldier. Believe it or not, under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, if you are um, a, have a good military character, whatever that is, um, that can diminish either being charged with an offense or can mitigate the sentencing. So the, the concern, though, is that you're disrupting the chain of command and command authority right. by essentially imposing upon the military system some sort of outside standard or outside uh, authority that takes away from a commander the, the authority. Uh, you have to think that some of them are well-meaning, that some of them mean to do well, and that maybe for some reason they're not. But in any case, what's your response to that, that it, it disrupts 
uh, the chain of command and command authority? Well, I, I would say it doesn't disrupt chain of command. Why do they want to handle these messy cases when they don't have any legal training, when they are concerned about training this unit to be able to go to Afghanistan? And if you take these cases out of the chain of command and give it to a separate office that specializes in it, you're, you know, you're done with them. And I would argue that it, it affects the cohesion of the unit and military readiness when you have this kind of um, tension in a unit like that. And, and thirdly, if you look at other um, uh, countries where they are based on a similar system, UK, Australia, Canada, Israel, they've all taken these cases out of the chain of command. Is it just, I mean, we've been very slow to adapt to women in the military to begin with. We're finally at the point now, and it's, it's still a surprise to read that we're only now at this point where women really can serve in, in forward combat units, although they have been, but sort of authorized and trained to go do that. Is it just that it's lagging behind um, the, way the, the, the way the normal sort of societal trends are unfolding? The military comes kicking and screaming to any social change, whether it's African Americans in the service uh, that are no longer segregated, whether it's gays in the service, and now whether it's women or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, even though this is something that Panetta did just before he left as Secretary of Defense, uh, there's now a lawsuit that's been filed because women who want to serve in the infantry are being told um, no. So. There's a lot of talk and not a lot of action. And, and, and this issue of military rape is really important to appreciate. There are more men that are sexually assaulted and raped in the military than women, really? just by the, the numbers, because there's so many more men. Mm -hmm. So it, it is, it's about power, it's about control, and it is uh, just an anathema, I think, to what we think of in normal society and how these kinds of cases are handled. Where do you think this is gonna go? I've always I mean, said have to, we have to we have to add you're a, you're a relatively junior member in the minority party. You have a chance to raise a, attention to the issue, which is something you've always been good at, um, and I mean that in the, in a positive sense that you can bring focus to an issue. Uh, but legislatively, um, it's pretty much going to have to come from the Senate, isn't it? Before something's well, going to happen. And in fact, um, because I started raising this issue and it got traction. Uh, Kirsten Gillibrand in the Senate has taken this issue on in a big way. Mm -hmm. She has over 50 members who support her amendment to take it out of the chain of command. She doesn't have 60, but the, now the question is whether or not they're even going to allow for amendments to the National Defense Authorization Act because of the lateness of the year and they're going to do what's called ping-ponging, which just probably is going to prevent amendments from being offered. Let's uh, shift gears a little bit um, to uh, the issue of gun violence and gun control. You're a victim of uh, gun violence yourself. We have these horrendous episodes. There's always a huge outcry, and then it seems like nothing happens. Is something ever going to happen where we begin to really affect um, these episodes, prevent them, prevent these weapons from being so freely and, and readily available to people? And, and now the issue is focusing sort of on the mental health approach, but still, uh, the simple readiness of these things to be available and to be used in this way is, is still very alarming, isn't it? Well, it's, it's more than alarming. It's, um, it, it, is, it is so um, outrageous, really, that the simple bill in the Senate that was just closing a loophole, it wasn't doing anything dramatic. It was not banning assault weapons. It was basically just closing the loopholes that exist in the law that was already the Brady bill mm -hmm. that basically said, if you want a gun, you've got to go through a background check. Except there was two exemptions, one for internet sales and one for gun shows. So, you know, all felons, all misdemeanants who've committed domestic violence, all persons that have mental health issues, just go online or go to a gun show and you don't have to be reviewed on any, in any matter. So, let, let me stop you there. Hold that thought. We'll be right back. Okay. We're going to take a quick break. Stay with us. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo First opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support, and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. 
nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. Over here we have Congresswoman Jackie Speer. We are talking about uh, gun violence, uh, gun control, and you were talking about even a small change, a really modest change in a bill, doesn't go anywhere. What's the atmosphere in Congress? Because you can tell that the atmosphere around the country is do something. And this, this sort of adds to that sense that people have that Congress isn't doing anything, especially about an issue where our children are getting killed. And when you realize that of all of the industrialized countries in the world, 80% of all the gun violence occurs here in the United States. 80%. Oh, we're number one. We're, yeah. <laughs> and um, when, you, when you realize the number of deaths a day due to gun violence, eight of them are kids, four of them are African American kids, and we sit back and do nothing, you know, it, you know, California has passed some of the most rigorous laws in the country. And even with these tough laws, 600,000 people last year bought guns in California. Yeah. If, so if so you, what is the answer? Is so, there an answer or is this just the way it's going to be and we're going to have to get used to it? No, the, you know, there'll be a, another horrendous new town. I mean, here we are almost on the anniversary of it. And, you know, some at some point, at some point there will be this tipping where, in fact, we finally say, you know, enough is enough. But the NRA is extraordinarily powerful. I mean, they were able to change the law so that the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms director had to be confirmed by the Senate. And once they did that, for seven years, there was no director at ATF. Well, and there's also a cap. That they've they've uh, restricted the amount of statistics that can be displayed and the show research, what's going on. Yeah. And the research that can yeah. be done. So what the president has done by executive order is um, actually allowed for some of that to happen. But even under George W. Bush and Clinton, the importation of these assault weapons was banned. Um, and then, I should say George... Um, H.W. H.W. And then when George W. came into he lifted the ban, and it's still lifted. I mean, that's something else that President Obama could do. So, um, you've got, you're on the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force. What's that doing, and is there anything tangible we can expect to see any time in, so like in the next session? We do have a bill. Mike Thompson is the, the chair of the committee, and it has 185 co-sponsors. Um, actually, not all the Democrats are even on it. Mm -hmm. And it is wallowing in the House, and the Senate, of course, um, couldn't bring itself to actually pass a leg piece of legislation on this issue. So, Well, that gets to... Um, the whole question of congressional dysfunction. Yeah, right. um, and everybody's, you know, everywhere you go, you read a, a pox on both their houses mm -hmm. that it's, you know, I don't care if they're Democrats or Republicans. I'm just tired of the gridlock. I'm tired of the dysfunction. I'm tired of the incivility, even, of how these discussions go about. What's it like to be there? And is it as bad as it seems? It's horrible. Yeah. It's absolutely horrible. And you know, it is pox on both houses and pox on both parties because we are so focused now on winning the next election. Now, the Senate, to its credit, has actually passed major pieces of legislation on immigration reform, on internet sales tax, and yet it comes over to the House and it sits. Um, they passed a, a farm bill um, then we lobbed a farm bill that didn't take care of, of food stamps. It is, it is a Congress that is the worst Congress in the history of this country in terms of legislation that's been passed and signed into law. And Why is it like this? I mean, is it just a different personality? I mean, there's no, the Tea Party has absolutely flummoxed the Republic, Republicans generally. And there is just this um, gotcha politics that goes on that is, you know, more about trying to win the next election. And the American people, you know, need to throw a lot of cold water on all of us to wake us up. Now, I do think the government shutdown, that the Republicans were, you know, swaggered, 
uh, around, walking around with this great swagger. Um, I think they got their hands slapped on that one, and they're not going to do that again. And so now they're focused on the Affordable Care Act. But I, I serve on oversight and government reform. It's all been gotcha politics. It's been Benghazi. It's been the IRS on uh, 501c4s. It's um, Affordable Care Act. I mean, they just keep pounding the drum beat to try and actually bring down the country. And, you know, you think about founding fathers. It was, it was country over party, mm -hmm. and now it's party over country. Is there an answer to this? Is it, you know, you go around the country and you look at how districts are drawn, uh, you know, and, and it's unlikely that many of these, uh, even if these Tea Party incumbents aren't reelected, it's unlikely they're going to be replaced by somebody who's substantially different on the political spectrum. And a lot of them do come with sort of this attitude of, I'm here to break down government, not to build up the country, because they think they're helping the country by doing that. I mean, they're, they're, they are people of, in some cases, of genuine conviction that they're doing the right thing. So how do you, how do you approach those kinds of people? How do you try to work with them? Well, first of all, I think that we've got to change the climate in the House. Um, to be more like the Senate, frankly, where Republicans and Democrats work together. I've reached across the aisle. I'm working with Walter Jones on issues around Afghanistan and the corruption in Afghanistan and, and bringing our troops home for good, not leaving 10 or 20,000 there. I'm working with Steve Womack from Arkansas on the Internet uh, Sales Tax and the Marketplace Fairness Act. And so there's, and I'm working with Pat Meehan on some military rape issues. So there are opportunities for us to work together and there are members on the other side of the aisle that are willing to do so. But when it comes to overarching issues, big, big issues like you know immigration reform, a small group can prevent um, the Republican majority from working with the Democrats. We're gonna take another break. You stick around and you do the same. We'll be right back. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo first opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support, and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Welcome, welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. This is Congresswoman Jackie Spear. Thank you for being with us. We were talking about congressional dysfunction, and you mentioned the Affordable Care Act. Some people call it, including the president, has been known to call it Obamacare. Um, and you talked about sort of the ebb and flow, and since this is the game, um, Democrats gained a lot in terms of public opinion during the, the government shutdown, um, but that's gone by the boards. The Republicans retreated on that, and now all they want to talk about is Obamacare and what a disaster it's been. In your opinion, has it been a disaster? And is it something that should be repealed? Absolutely not repealed. And it hasn't been a disaster. The website um, was uh, an unmitigated disaster <laughs> failure, but it's been fixed. And yesterday there were 775,000 people um, online. People want health insurance. People do not want to go bare, and uh, they want affordable health insurance. There's lots of good news stories in this, and it's going to take time for it to, to, to roll out effectively, and we've got to be part of making sure that happens. Mm -hmm. you, you do hear stories. I don't know if they're anecdotal uh, or they you know, represent a genuine percentage of people who find that the health care they had has been canceled and that the one they have to get now is substantially more expensive. Uh, in, or the fines are more expensive than what they were paying. More money for less coverage. How frequent is that? I know your office must be getting calls mm -hmm. all the time. How much is this turning up? So uh, there is an issue there. Uh, now, the plans they did have, catastrophic policies, typically $5,000 deductibles with um, then coverage with with or without a copay, uh, but 
they typically don't have all the benefits that they now have. They typically had annual caps, they had lifetime caps, uh, they didn't cover pre-existing conditions. Now, the bronze plan, which is typical to a catastrophic, um, has all those protections in it. And for some people, it's actually the premiums have gone up. Uh, I've had lots of constituents in Kaiser that ha have gone from $300 premiums a month to $600 premiums a month, and they're upset, and I don't blame them. So I think we have to, and I'm crafting a bill right now, to allow people who have had their premiums go, go up more than 75% to be able to get what's called a substandard policy in the marketplace, which exists. And these people could find that kind of a policy again and um, have it for a period of time. Yeah. The, um, is your expectation that these things will be worked out, that you, you should, nobody should have expected this to be perfect from the moment it, it started? No, you know, nothing is ever perfect from the moment it started. Medicare wasn't. Certainly, if you look back at the headlines when the prescription drug benefit in Medicare came in um, to being, there were lots of problems with it. It took mm -hmm. two, three years for it to, to, to be fixed. I mean, when it comes to IT, government is bad. Yeah, well, and we should have brought in you know, Silicon Valley a lot earlier. Speaking of that, you represent, you know, northern San Mateo County, some of San Francisco. You represent uh, uh, probably a growing number of younger professionals in the tech industry um, who are the people that they really need to have sign up for this uh, health care program. Is it your sense from your own constituents that that targeted group is participating? Well, in Cal Covered California, uh, the, those participating, that younger, actually typically 25 to 35, because you can stay on your parents' plan now until you're 26, that that age group is signing up representative to their per percentage of the population. That's here in California. Nationally, um, not quite as robust, but much like the Massachusetts experience over time, uh, they came on board as well. Let's talk a little bit about ga gas pipeline safety. Uh, terrible explosion in San Bruno, it's in your district. Um, is there a federal um, role in that? And what, and what would it be other than the, what you do best, which is draw, I shouldn't say best, but what you do well, which is draw attention to an important issue. But is there a federal role there? Oh, absolutely there is. Um, actually, the uh, federal office called FIMSA, Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration um, authorizes the CPUC in, in our state, California Public Utilities Commission, to do its job, which is to oversee pipeline safety. Now, um, after the explosion, and boy, if there ever was a time that I felt that there was a reason for me to be in Congress, it was after the San Bruno explosion and helping that community uh, pick, its, pick the pieces up. Uh, I tried to get language into a renewal of the pipeline safety law, and ironically, you know, not so ironically, the industry controls that issue in Congress. And the measure I was trying to get in was these remote uh, valves to be able to either turn them off remotely or automatically, because in San Bruno it took an hour and a half to mm -hmm. turn off um, the, the, the valve. So uh, I pushed very hard to get that in. You know what they gave me? They gave me that automatic remote um, shutoff valve should be put in place on new pipeline if it is technologically feasible and economically feasible. Well, when is it going to be economically feasible? So they, they window dress something and, and say they fixed it when they haven't. So I'm still beating the drum on that issue as well. Mm -hmm. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the 2014 elections. We were talking about the ebb and flow of um, partisanship in, in Congress. Uh, is it possible the Democrats are going to take back the House? And we talked before about a pox on both your houses. Does it make a difference if the Democrats are in charge versus the Republicans? Well, I do think that if you have a, a democratically controlled House and you have a democratic controlled Senate, I mean, the, the potential of, of getting legislation passed and signed into law is just much greater. I mean, the bills that we pass now in the House with the Republican-only majority with no Democratic support just sits in the, the Senate um, chamber and, and gathers dust. And it's, a, it's frankly just a fundraising tool for, for the Republicans, and they know it. So um, can we take back the House in 2014? There is, I think, a distinct possibility that we could 
a lot will depend on just what's happening in September and October of next year. It's going to be, it's not going to be easy because the reapportionment lines have been drawn in such a way across the country by typically Republican Republicanly controlled legislatures to, you know, create districts that are only going to be won by Republicans. Mm -hmm. And let's talk a little bit about 2016. Um, I would imagine you're getting more email than I am uh, from people who are already revving up support for Hillary Clinton. Uh, what's your view about her as a presidential candidate? There will never be a person running for president that is more prepared than Hillary Clinton, mm -hmm. and she will run. There's no doubt in my mind that yeah. she will, will run. Will you support her? Absolutely. Did you support her before? I did. Yeah, tell me why. Uh, well, I thought that she was extraordinarily capable at, um, in the 20, 2008 election cycle. Um, she you know, represents the values that I think are, are very important, and she, um, she came very close. How important is it to you that a woman be president? Someday well, in our lifetime. I, I think that um, much like everything else in, in our history, um, it, equality is, is what really makes this country so strong. And having our, the first African American president was huge. And um, I was sitting on that platform when he was inaugurated, and the millions of people uh, on that mall were, were just a testament to how we really value equality and it's time for a woman and it's going to happen in my lifetime and um, hopefully my daughter will be the second. Well I'm going to have to stop our conversation there. The other one will go on for a while. Jackie Spear, thank you so much for being with us and thank you for joining us. Join us next time on The Game.